Talk Show. Recorded live. Hello, this is uh, Mike, and uh, once again we have another episode of uh, Romanism and the Reformation 2014, and um, uh, Tom will be leading us in a discussion about flattery. Yes, thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me, and uh, and uh, good evening to your listeners. Tonight's subject is flattery. It is uh, one of the most effective tools Satan has against God's people. Flattery. Have you ever been flattered? I have. Lots of times. And uh, usually what come of it, comes of it is mischief. Uh, an attempt to control me, as a matter of fact. Uh, an attempt to uh, get me to do something against my conscience. Flattery works, and uh, we should recognize what flattery is and uh, build up walls against it and never to practice it because to practice it is to follow in the footsteps of the deceiver. I want to give the first example in the Bible of satanic flattery. Uh, It comes in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in the first verse, and uh, this demonstrating that flattery is the domain of Satan. It's a matter of control and deceit, and uh, it preys on the conceit of fallen man, and uh, it preys on his fallen nature, because it was by flattery that man fell. And you'll see this for yourself as we read God's holy word in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. He says, now this is after the creation, and it says, now the serpent, which we recognize as Satan, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, Hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, The subtle serpent, he said, quote, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Notice the subtlety of the serpent, Satan, and the tool with which he used to corrupt Eve and to cause her to do that which God forbade, and even she caused her her husband to do that which God forbade. Where is the subtlety of the serpent? Subtlety. It's just, just a word that has negative connotations all through it, but yet it's championed as a human virtue, isn't it? Subtlety. Uh, Oftentimes a person who speaks frankly and openly about a subject will be regarded by his listeners sometimes as um, too cocksure of himself or maybe even uh, arrogant or uh, abusive or offensive. The human ear doesn't like black and white statements. The human ear is tickled by gray, by subtlety. And this is the case with Eve, when the serpent said, ye shall not surely die. Now, of course, they were free, even in the garden, to eat of, of the tree of life, weren't they? They weren't forbidden to eat from any tree but the knowledge of good and evil. So they ate freely of the tree of life. They had it all. But Satan made them desire 
that which God had forbidden and brought into question not only God's authority, but to insinuate to Eve that God had lied to them or that God was keeping something valuable from them. And what is really uh, most apparent to me is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, and it says, this is Satan speaking now, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. Now, where did Satan get this idea? Wasn't it Satan in Isaiah chapter 14, verses uh, 12 through 14, who established uh, that he would be as God, sitting in uh, sitting on the mount of the congregation, and to be like the Most High, to elevate himself above the heights of the stars, the heights of the clouds, and to be like the Most High? He flattered himself, didn't he? And in so doing, he rebelled against the Creator, his Creator, our Creator. And because of his pride and, and arrogance and, and uh, uh, selfish flattery, in other words, flattering of himself, he, he, he was he cast out of heaven, and he took a third of the angels with him. So this subtlety of Satan and uh, his propensity to flatter both himself and others drew a third of the angels with him. So we can see how effective this this subtlety of of, uh, flattery was. First, he caused Satan to fall himself, and then to draw a third of the angels with him. So one just naturally comes to the conclusion that of all of all the tools of Satan, flattery is the name of his game. It's his domain. Now, he says. If you eat of this tree, your eyes shall be opened, insinuating that they were blind, weren't they? I mean, I mean, here they had free access to the tree of life and to all the other trees in the garden, both to keep them and to eat the fruit of them. But Satan implied that until they eat of the forbidden tree, their eyes would not be opened. And at the time of the opening of their eyes, they would realize that they were be, would be as gods. Well, they weren't gods. They were man and wife, weren't they? Created in God's image. Free to eat of the tree of life. In other words, they were never to die. Adam and Eve were never to die, but didn't have life eternal. Until that time, no death had come into the kingdom, into the garden. But Satan flattered the woman, and notice who he chose to flatter. Not Adam, but Eve. And through Eve, he destroyed Adam. Adam was the ultimate target. And he promised them in so many words that if they ate of that forbidden tree, that they would be as gods. And so there went forth the temptation. It wasn't so much that the tree was desirable or the fruit of the tree was desirable, except according to the scripture, to make one wise. In other words, it was more wise, it would bring forth more wisdom to the man and his wife if they ate that tree than to partake of the wisdom of God and to obey his commandments 
and to have complete and total and continual fellowship with God and to live forever. I mean, literally, from, from our perspective, Adam and Eve were already like gods, weren't they, with eternal life and, and a perfect harmony walking hand in hand with their creator. What more could you ask? And what is there to distinguish between Adam and his maker at that point? None that I can see, except that one was the creator and the other was the created. They were given a a comfortable place to live with all of their needs met. Could freely come and go as they please, eating of all the trees of the garden, except one. And Satan, through flattery, achieved Adam and Eve's destruction. And each and every one of us have in, have been inherited that same destruction. We don't live forever. We're mortal because of the fall and because of Satan's flattery. So Satan obtained the control of Adam and Eve through flattery. And he caused them to do that which they knew God forbid. And he used the weaker vessel, the woman, to achieve that destruction through flattery. I want to tell my listeners that any time flattery is used, by someone against you, and by implication, I'm telling you that you should perceive flattery as a threat, not to be uh, uh, desired, but to be shunned, you'll find that the flatterer, once he has gained the upper hand over you through flattery, will always try to control you. Now, look, if, if, if someone comes to you and flatters you, what are you most likely to do? To return that flattery, right? In other words, someone addresses you, my, you look pretty today. Well, you don't look so bad yourself, do you? You know, see how it works? And so, so there's flattery comes with it an obligation to repay and uh, uh, so the sin is shared then automatically shared and and you may say something contrary to your to your observation or to your your conviction but yet you 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 do what is suggested by the flattery in the first place to repay the flattery with flattery And then an untruth is told. Flattery comes with it an obligation. You ever ever see the federal government come to you in one manner or another and say, we want to help you. We want you to sign on to this program, and if you sign on to this program for a measly uh, so much percentage of your income, we will repay you, and, and in 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 full and then some. But what do we see today? We see people who have paid all of their lives in taxes and social security who are not going to receive those benefits back, as promised from the government. And not only that, they've taken our money and that by fraud and used it to fight wars all over the world and to give that money to people who are not even citizens of this country. And so once that money, once flattery has taken its toll and the money is surrendered to the government, you've lost control of your money and you have no way to sue the government to get it back. You see how flattery works and what expense it causes? 
First, there was the fall of the Garden of Eden, and then practically every oppression that exists today comes as a result of flattery. I'll tell you something else about flattery that I've experienced in my life over and over and over again. I've had I've been subject to it, and I've seen other people be subject to it. I've seen people practice it. I've seen people return that flattery, and it always ends in mischief. If a man will use flattery, if another human being will use flattery, you can automatically uh, uh, you can automatically suspect that that person is trying to gain some level of control over you, and the more flattering that person is, the more power they're trying to gain over you, and they literally, in time, make slaves of you. And aren't, aren't we all slaves to our government? I mean, if, if the government controls our retirement benefits in the form of Social Security, can, cannot the, the government also lay stipulations uh, upon that, that uh, entitlement? And what stipulations uh, might the government levy against that entitlement? Could it be that they would force you to uh, uh, sign on to a particular, uh, another particular government program or vote a certain way or uh, uh, make limitations upon other aspects of your life that you would not ordinarily lend to someone else. And that everybody says, anytime you take government assistance, it comes with a catch. It comes with a hook. And likewise, Satan's subtlety. Satan said, ye shall not surely die. But in the day that you eat of the fruit herein, you shall be as gods. Your eyes will be opened, and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. And yet they died, just like God told them. So it's not a characteristic of a god to die, is it? But when when Adam and Eve rejected God's authority and voluntarily subjected themselves to Satan's authority through subtlety, they died against Satan's promise. They died spiritually and physically. When beforehand, there was no death in the Garden of Eden. And every time we succumb to flattery, whether it comes from Satan, whether it comes from the beast, that is the civil government, we die, and subtle and and subtlety and and uh, false promises associate and 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 compounded with flattery is how we're drawn into this hook when God wanted us to be free. God did not want us to have a common money bag with unbelievers. He said, "Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers." But through flattery and false promises from our so-called Christian government, we become slaves. And not only that, but they have pooled our money into a common bag, our tax money, our Social Security money, and they give it to the wicked. And... That is why our society is destroyed morally and spiritually. It's because the wicked now have the power. We take, the government takes from the godly and gives to the wicked. It takes from the haves and gives to the have-nots. It's called the redistribution of wealth. But God calls it sin. 
And it's just like charities. Once you take your money and you give to a charity, you have absolutely no control over who gets the money. And if you're a hardworking, industrial, industrious, Bible-believing Christian, you take that money from your family and your heirs and you give it to a wicked organization that pools all that money and finances to ingratiate its, its, uh, its organizational structure, the people that run the charity, and then take what's left, what pity, pitiful amount that is left, and they give it to the wicked. And that's why the whole world suffers morally. When in the history of Israel did God say to collect up, to gather up a collection for the wicked? Never once. But our whole system is built on this with false promises and flattery. Now that same person who will flatter you, thereby enslaving you or obliging you to return likewise, or to hook you into a debtor's uh, position toward that person. It's the same one who would issue you a reward or a bribe. Okay? Now you know why our court systems are corrupt, why our political system is corrupt. They love to flatter one another, don't they? Senator so-and-so, Congressman so-and-so, President so-and-so, Chief Justice so-and-so. And yet, they bribe one another. And they bring false accusation and false verdict against the righteous. So, I want to give you from the Scriptures some examples where the word flatteries and flattery is used. First, the word flatteries, plural. Flattery, plural, flatteries. The first example, and there are three, comes from Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. A vile person who the people will not give honor to the kingdom, but he will still obtain the kingdom by flattery. Here's another example, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. In other words, they won't fall for the flatteries, will they? Let me read it again. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Another example, Daniel chapter 11, verse 34. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Okay? Flatteries. Let's try the word flattery, the singular form of the word. Let me bring them up here. I remember how to do this. The first example we find in Job chapter 17, verse 5. He that speaketh flattery to his friends, even the eyes of his children shall fail. Let me read it again. He that speaketh flattery to his friends, even the eyes of his children shall fail. In other words, there's a curse that comes to one who speaks flatteries to gain an unfair or unholy advantage. 
to abuse the trust of his friends. God issues a curse. Even the eyes of his children shall fail. God hates flattery. It was Satan's tool. Here's another example. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 24. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, the flattery of a st- of the tongue of a strange woman. And what do we know in the scriptures about how God uses the the woman in scripture? It's it's always used to describe a church, isn't it? To keep thee from the evil woman, that is the evil church, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, a strange church. Now, where do we see the example of flattery being used by a church? Well, all of them, mostly, because they teach us, all of them collectively teach us nowadays, not in the times of the Protestant Reformation or throughout the Christian era, but in our generations, the churches teach that, well, you're okay and I'm okay and we're on our way to becoming gods, aren't we? Isn't that what they teach? Do they teach humility? Do they teach obedience? Do they teach that we should regard one another as better than ourselves and that we should be servants of the other and that we should not lord it over one another? But today it's all about prestige. It's all about self-image, isn't it? It's all, it's all about self-respect and raising yourself up. You're not a fallen uh, human being, uh, a, 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 pro, uh, a progeny of the fallen Adam. You're beyond the curse of the, the Garden of Eden. Now we need to stand up as Christians and take the kingdom. Okay? But when, when is it said that the people, will, that the saints will take the kingdom? when Christ establishes it. He said, then he will give the saints the kingdom. So anybody who says that we need to take the kingdom before Christ returns is a flatterer, isn't he? And he causes you to forget your humility. He causes you to forget your fall. And he gives you a divine right before that divine right is settled. Before that divine right is, 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 comes from God. In other words, you're taking the promise of God from someone who's not authorized to give it. And where is flattery the most obvious in the so-called church, the quote-unquote church? In other words, Satan, the flatterer, Satan, the deceiver, takes Christ up into a high mountain and shows him the temple and, and, and other things. And he says to Jesus, he says, See all the kingdoms of the world and the glory thereof? All of them I will give to you if you will just bow down and worship me. Everybody remembers that story. You can quote it almost verbatim. Uh, it just, just to be precise, we'll get it and read it. Okay. Then it begins in verse one. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That's the serpent, Satan, the dragon. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungry. In other words, he was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, that is Satan, the serpent, the devil, he said. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Okay? But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, 
and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So, Jesus, the creator of all heaven and earth, the Bible says in John that he created everything, and nothing was created that was not created by him, right? <clears throat> Here, the devil, the dragon, and Satan takes Jesus up to a high mountain and at one single glance shows him all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory of them and offers them to him as though he didn't already own them. What does the Bible say? The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. What does it mean when he says the fullness thereof? In other words, there's not anything of this world that I did not create. It is mine. I created it. And yet here's the devil trying to tempt the creator with all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Satan is, in, in effect, telling the creator that he, Satan, the dragon, the deceiver, owns all the kingdoms of the world. And what does the Bible tell us? What does Daniel tell us about kings and kingdoms? He calls them the beast, doesn't he? First, there were four beasts, the winged lion, the, 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 the bear, the leopard, and then the, the, the wild beast, right? That was Medo-Persia. Uh, that was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. So what kingdoms did Satan show? Jesus, and the glory of them. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. He showed him the beast, the four beasts that Daniel predicted, prophesied about, and all of their glory. And he used flattery, saying, I will give all of these to you, all of these kingdoms if you'll just bow down and worship me. That's all you got to do. There's the hook, right? But what does his father do? What did Jesus' father say? That he would be the heir of the earth. So here Satan is trying to take the place of his father and to flatter Jesus into taking his kingdoms early. When the Bible, in particular Daniel chapter 7, says that when that fourth and final beast comes to its end, there would be a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands that would strike that image in the feet, grind it to powder, and blow away at the wind. So Daniel clearly prophesied that Jesus, that stone that was cut out of the mountains without hands, would put an end to all earthly kingdoms. That's what Daniel prophesied by the word of God, that Jesus would inherit the earth and all earthly kingdoms would be destroyed. And knowing that Jesus refused, I want to interject this. I don't want to change the, dis the, dis the direction of the discussion, but, but look right here. Satan Offering the kingdoms of this earth to Jesus is tantamount to offering Jesus the role of Antichrist in the world. To be Satan's vicar. And Jesus rejected that, knowing what his inheritance would be. But first, he had to redeem mankind 
to God. Otherwise, there would be no subjects in the kingdom. Because all of those who are not in his kingdom will be destroyed, won't they? So he went to the cross and died. In other words, he became the Christ, not the Antichrist. Satan offered him the position of Antichrist in the world to take his kingdoms now, as long as he would bow down and worship Satan. But instead, he was obedient to his father, believing the promises of the father, and he went to the cross to bear our sins and to fulfill his salvific role for mankind and to establish his kingdom that will be established on this earth once Satan's kingdoms, the beasts, are all destroyed. Literally, in this, in this, in this Matthew chapter 4, we see Satan trying to make Christ the Antichrist. Does that make sense to you, Michael? Uh, Yeah, it does. Well, look, Satan rejected his offer. We all know that to be true. Satan took his place, his prophesied place, and bore our sins. He became sin for us and redeemed us to God. But Satan was left without a vicar, wasn't he? Who do you think he offered that that uh, vicarship to? <laughs> well, he said not... to he said to someone else, didn't he? He yeah. said he said, "See all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them." All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Who, who did he offer that to, Michael? Well, we know it today as the papacy. That's right. Uh, but, you know, it's an interesting question. I, hope, I don't mean to deviate too much, but is there, you know, we think about that, what happened with Christ, and then we have Simon Magus. Who did go? What, who did uh, Satan go to next? Do you know? Do you have any ideas, theories on that? Because um, eventually he went to the papacy after the pagan Roman Empire fell. I mean, did he go straight to the Caesars? Um, I mean, I don't want to deviate too much, but well, I think it's clear from the scripture that all the beasts that Daniel described, uh, while they may have served the purposes of God with uh, in punishing Israel for their apostasies and abominations and idolatries and Babylonian worship, uh, he used, you know, these beast kingdoms to punish Israel. Right. And uh, they still exist today. That fourth and final beast is still ex- in existence today and still controlling the world today. And what does it do? It, it punishes God's people. And then we're talking about Rome. It's guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Right, right. And it's Rome. Wow, it's amazing. It, it just passed. It just passed from the what is what what the world believes it was the old pagan Roman Empire, and and passed on to the well the Holy Roman Empire, absolutely, which the early Christians feared its coming, even prayed for the longevity of the Caesars because they knew that when that when that pagan Roman Empire was destroyed, there would be an even worse tyrant upon the earth. There would be an even worse persecution of 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 the true believers in Christ. And that's exactly what happened in history. That's exactly what happened in history. So there was one who did accept Satan's offer. See all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them? All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And what what does the papacy control? All the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. You read examples of it before the program. It even controls the press. 
And I want to remind the listeners that the, there were only prophesied by Daniel four Gentile kingdoms until Christ returns. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman. Now, if anybody tells you that you know the Roman Empire fell, well, then you have to say that Jesus destroyed it because Daniel's vision clearly says that when Christ returns, he will destroy that image. Grind it to powder, and it'll blow away with the wind. And those four B systems were represented by the head of gold, the shoulder and arms of silver, the, the thighs of bronze, and the, the iron legs and, and, and uh, feet mixed with miry clay. And then the stone, which is cut out of the mountain, will strike that image in the feet. In other words, at the end of the fourth and final empire on the earth, the Roman Empire, and blow away with the wind. So if you say that the Roman Empire was destroyed, then Christ has come. And the papacy has latched right on to that. They say the pagan Roman Empire was the end of that fourth and final empire, and now Christ's kingdom has come, and his head is the pope. It's absolutely amazing, Tom. When you think about it, I hate, I'm sorry to deviate a little bit from it, but when you look at the parallel story in the New Testament, there's God and his people, and then there's Satan and his people. Yep. And as clear as day, from I mean, we're talking from the fourth chapter of Matthew all the way through Revelations, <laughs> this, this Roman Empire, this, you know, the Holy Roman Empire that we're under now, uh, and what the it's papal, been up to the papal, the papal Roman Empire. Let's be per- perfectly, you know, let's be perfect in our description so as not to confuse anybody. That that which is called the Holy Roman Empire is really the papal Roman Empire. Yeah, and if you guys get, if anybody gets a chance, go back to last night's show on the uh, the uh, the bowls and the trumpets and uh, the seals. And I, and I, and you go to see that that's talking about the the papal Roman Empire, the, the pagan and the papal Roman Empire, all the way through to the end. It's amazing. It's absolutely when the book comes alive, when it finally comes alive, at least for me, and it brings up you know the truth about how wicked this institution is and who they have always been our enemy. Yeah. You know, but you know, go back to what you're saying, though, about yeah. but about flattery and that's what they okay. use isn't that what they use oh absolutely they use uh, uh, adulations and, and, and praises and you know titles and what gems and gold and wealth yeah you know? and and remember it says in the scripture speaking of the papacy or the antichrist the little horn of daniel the son of perdition the man of sin the antichrist of the bible it says, and the dragon gave him his seat, his power, and authority. His seat, the the they call it Saint they call it Saint Peter's throne. It's the throne of Satan himself. His power and great authority. So Satan made good on his promise, didn't he? If you bow down and worship me. I'll give you the, the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of them all. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. And what does it say in the scripture? That, and they worship the dragon who gave power unto the beast, which is the, the Roman power, the papacy. So it's Satan that gives the papacy its power and seat and great authority in the world. There's the fulfillment of what of what Satan tried to beguile Jesus with. A flattering offer. If you'll become my vicar and bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Well, Jesus had a better kingdom, didn't he? He didn't want an earthly kingdom. He wanted a heavenly kingdom. His father offered him a heavenly kingdom, not an earthly one. Okay? So we hear the, we see the great deceiver, the great flatterer, the great mischief maker, the dragon, 
Satan himself found another one who would take him up on his offer. And what is he? The head of all the governments of the world. And how did he? Uh, uh, how did he become the one to crown and uncrown the kings of the earth? By flatteries. First of all, he elevated himself as the, the successor of Peter, as if that was something, made an issue out of something, uh, just pulled a rabbit out of his hat. The Pope's not the successor of Peter. He's the su- successor of Simon Magus, the magician. And we can go into that, but I don't want to, I don't want to de- detract from what we're, the point we're trying to make. And he elevated himself as the vicar of Christ on the earth. In other words, Christ's replacement. In other words, Jesus Christ himself hidden under a veil of flesh. That's what the papacy calls itself. Jesus Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. That's Roman Catholic canon law. It's imperative that every Roman Catholic believe that on pain of excommunication. And uh, so having once through history gradually elevated the papacy from just an equal among bishops to become bishop of bishops and lord and king of the world, now the papacy has the power of Satan in his hand to flatter the kings of the earth. And literally place their crowns upon their heads. Okay? It means more to the kings of the earth rather to be crowned by their own people and to rule for the good of their own people to be crowned by the vicar of Christ. And so they submit to his authority by flattery. The papacy's got his hook into them by flattery. And the first example of the crowning of a, of, a, of a Roman emperor was Charles the Great. And, of course, his father, Pepin, was also flattered by the papacy. And because of that flattering, uh, Pepin wiped out all the papacy's enemies. It was by him that those three little horns were uprooted. And then uh, Pepin's son, who... the who the world, who the historians regard as Charles the Great or Charlemagne, that means Charles the Great, literally went to the Vatican to receive his crown from the Pope. And it's the first example in history where the Pope placed the crown upon the head of a civil government, emperor of the Roman Empire. And it was through Charlemagne that the Pope ruled all of Europe, all of the Roman Empire, just like the Caesars did, and by the same authority. Satan. Okay. The dynasty of, of, of this goes all the way back to Babylon. All the Gentile kings thought themselves to be emanations of God. That was true of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great was regarded as a god. I mean, that's why they call him Alexander the Great. And the Caesars called themselves Pontifex Maximus, the Supreme Pontiff, which is the the very title, one of the many very titles uh, maintained by the papacy today. Pontifex Maximus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so... uh, and all of them achieved by flattery. Now, the American people today unwittingly think that when they go to the polls, they actually pick the president and, and the king of this country. But they don't. Uh, they go to the polls, surely they cast a vote, surely, but it's the papacy that makes all the candidates. No one is offered, no one is given an opportunity to run for president or any high office in this country that isn't thoroughly vetted by the papacy. And and all they do, all they allow us to do is to just vote for one of however many candidates that the papacy puts in the position. 
And so it looks like we live in a democracy when, in fact, the Pope still places the crown on the kings because he picked them as candidates to start with. And it's under the papacy's authority that they rule. And uh, we, we pretend that we have a constitution in the United States, but it's completely been overthrown if the papacy has anything to say about who can run for president of the United States of America. And it's the Council on Foreign Relations and other think tanks, Vatican think tanks in this country, that, that uh, groom certain individuals for the candidacy of president. And... Uh, so the papacy has his way. He's even in this, even in this, uh, they call it a democracy. It's not a democracy at all. It's a kingdom. You know, look, I, I've said it before. If the people had any power in the voting booth, they wouldn't allow us to do it, would they? I mean, we're losing all of our rights. Uh, the president seems to be controlled by uh, a power outside the country. The, and, and the controlling authority of the, of, of, of the presidency has, has outstripped the bounds of the Constitution. He now rules more like a king than as an elected president. And that's because he is a king. In the eyes of the papacy, he is a king. He's been crowned by the papacy, and he owes his allegiance to the papacy. He owes his obedience to the papacy, and he rules at the papacy's behest. And any time that a king of this country, president of the United States, abandons the authority that is that is given to him, that is vested in him by the Pope, then they JFK him. And so, uh, if, I mean, we must believe the prophecies of Daniel. And if, and, if, and if we begin to add to or take away from the prophecies of Daniel, and we begin to read history contrary to what Daniel prophesied, then we've acknowledged we've been deceived. The fourth and final beast on the earth is still in power. It was in power at the time when Christ walked the face of the earth. It was that Roman power that put him to the cross. It was that Roman power that persecuted God's the first century Christians, and it was all just carried on by the papacy after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Caesar, the Caesarian Empire, and it became the papal empire. And it, it just took on the cloak of Christianity. Well, it's not Christianity at all. It's anti-Christianity. It is the beast. Okay? It is the man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, the antichrist of the Bible. And it's still flattery that keeps it afloat. Satan is still saying, see all the kingdoms of the world and the glory thereof? All of them I will give to you if you'll just bow, bow down and worship me. And, this, and the scripture confirms it is the dragon who gave him the seat and power and great authority and they worshiped the dragon and gave their power and strength unto him. So now people will say, Tom, your, your discussion of flattery has, has really attacked my patriotism. Let me ask you something. Of what kingdom do you belong? To what kingdom do you belong? Do you belong to an earthly Roman kingdom? That kingdom that crucified our Christ and persecuted the saints of Almighty God and who still wages holy Roman crusades all over the world to help elevate the papacy to global sovereignty, global control over religious and civil law? Or... Do you have another king and another kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness? He hasn't bought us by flattery. He's bought us with his own blood. He doesn't come to us and say, let me help you. He comes to us and says, I died for you. 
no flattery, only mercy. And yet we all go to the polls, we all cast our votes, and we're deceived. We're deceived by a government that survives on flattery and deceit and takes away the liberty whereby Christ hath made us free. You see how far flattery can go? That which was started in the garden that deceived Adam and Eve has now come to full fruition. And we've got to make a choice who we're going to serve. I think I'll leave it go for that. Uh, for, uh, right here, Michael, and thanks for having me this evening. And blessings in the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago, Christ the righteous. Thanks, Michael.